Good morning, everyone. We're just getting started. We're going to officially start at the top of the hour. This is Dave Meyer with BusyWeb, and I'm here with Twin West, and we have Kurt Erickson, Alice Kirkland, and John Paul Yates as our presenters today. Um, I'm going to run through a few things right at the top of the hour, but for now, we're just letting everybody get online, and we're going to hang on. So welcome, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. Dave, I think you've done this before. <laughs> oh, yes. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite things to do. I'm actually, uh, I, I do a lot of this stuff on the road, too. It's tremendous fun. Got it. Let's see participants. We've got Laura, Mo, and Stephen online already. Welcome, guys. Good morning. Good morning. As a reminder for folks, if you do have questions for Alice or Kurt um, or JP, you can also just send that in via chat or the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen or at the top of the screen, depending on if you're on full screen or not. All right, we're at the top of the hour, so I wanted to welcome everybody. This is, uh, I am Dave Meyer with BusyWeb, and we are delighted to be helping out Twin West to deliver some of these essential communications around COVID-19 and the coronavirus and how it's affecting our community in the Twin West footprint. Um, John Paul Yates is here with us and he's going to give a brief introduction, but welcome to John Paul, Kurt and Alice. For the folks that are online with us, you can't talk unfortunately, but you can chat and ask questions. So you can either use the Q&A feature or the chat feature to ask your questions. And we will mostly take those questions at the end of today's event, but um, feel free to ask them as necessary. And if something urgent pops up or that's especially timely, we might break in. But uh, Alice and Kurt have been very gracious and are ready to rock. So JP, your presentation, or this is you. Thanks, Dave. And on behalf of the Twin West Chamber, I wanna thank all our members for participating with us this morning. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do this event this morning without the support of two of our members, also the board members first. I want to thank Dave Meyer from BusyWeb for helping facilitate uh, this web webinar this morning. And then also really grateful for Kurt Erickson, um, who is a partner at Littler, also serves on the Twin West board, and his coworker Alice Kirkland, who are going to walk us through a lot of the questions kind of a lot of our small business employers are probably thinking through as they evaluate if they have to make staffing adjustments, what are the differences between furloughs, layoffs, um, what are those implications on people being able to seek unemployment benefits, and then also what are kind of some of the new regulations related to sick and safe leave that have uh, passed as part of uh, different iterations of the federal stimulus bills. And so, um, Thank you for participating. If you think this is going to be useful to other employees you have, um, we will record uh, the whole webinar. It will be available on our website later today, um, so you can refer to it in the future and direct uh, employees to it if you have any further questions. We want to be as much of a resource as possible as we're navigating this uh, unprecedented time. And so we're grateful to have you with us. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kurt Erickson and uh, Alice Kirkland from Littler. Thanks for being with us. Well, thanks so much, John Paul and Dave for, uh, for uh, putting this seminar together or uh, sending it out, I should say. Um, I like that line, John Paul, about this being unprecedented times because that's really the beginning of uh, our presentation. Um, the unemployment compensation insurance system uh, was actually started in unprecedented times, which were the Great Depression. And the whole idea behind it when it was started was to get money flowing through the system. And I see um, that's my ugly mug there, but Alice is a, is a different uh, ball of wax than, than me. So. Um, so the next one, there we go. The unemployment compensation uh, insurance system was actually started back in the 1930s during the Great Depression. Um, and uh, that's gonna be the first thing that we talk about with regard to this, uh, because that, 
the purpose behind the act not only applied in the 1930s, but it really comes into play now because we're in, as John Paul said, unprecedented times or times that we haven't visited for a long, long time. Um, to that end, the other matters that we're going to discuss deal with Minnesota unemployment insurance basics, such as how do we calculate um, who's eligible, whether it's part-time or full-time. And then we go to Governor Walz's uh, Executive Order 20-05, which says here's how we're going to interpret and apply the Minnesota unemployment laws during this unprecedented time. And then finally, we go to the Coronavirus Aid Relief Act that um, the Senate initially passed, the House of Representatives passed, and, and um, President Trump signed on March 27, just a few short days ago. And uh, lo and behold, uh, it, uh, along with the, uh, uh, the federal, the Families First Corona Response Act go into effect pretty much immediately. The, the Families First Corona Response Act goes into effect tomorrow. Um, one of the things that we've gotten in some questions anticipating this seminar were, what about if we lay somebody off? How does that, um, how does that deal with, uh, how does that impact our ability to go to the Small Business Administration for loans? So one of the things I wanted to talk about and, and make sure that everyone knows about, uh, particularly for small and medium-sized businesses, is that the Corona, that the CARES Act, and I guess I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but the CARES Act provides a variety of different types of relief, relief for uh, small and medium-sized businesses, including emergency loans, including, including Payroll Protection Act uh, payments, all things that you ought to think about as a business owner before you necessarily go down the road of laying, um, laying people off because some of these acts may allow you to keep your business operating, most importantly, retain your employees during this difficult time and perhaps be in a better position to go forward and, and start engaging in business again, come let's say the middle of May or the middle of June, whenever, um, whenever the economy comes back and we uh, perhaps have some relief from the stay at home orders. Um, in the next slide, we talk about, again, um, the act was created in 1935. As a result of the Great Depression, um, people immediately kept their money. They immediately stopped um, paying money to, you know, laid off employees, threw employees out of work, and it all cascaded down. So the whole idea here was to keep money flowing through the system give some relief to workers um, in terms of a modest stipend. And by keeping them in, in money, so to speak, and keeping money flowing through the system, bring the economy back, or at least not have the economy sink to unparalleled lows. And we're in that situation now. And to our credit, uh, the federal government, as well as the state government, has learned some of the lessons from the Great Depression and has aggressively tried to inject money into the system, both through the unemployment insurance system, as well as through the other parts of the CARES Act that I just mentioned, such as emergency loans and, variety, and, and forgivable loans uh, through the CARES Act. So the whole idea is to provide remedies to employees but in addition to that, to keep money flowing through the economy so the economy uh, maintains some basic um, stability and, and doesn't fall through the floor, so to speak. Right, and so the, the way that the unemployment um, system is structured, it was created on a federal level um, by law that establishes some really basic requirements for each state and then the states have the ability to administer individual programs. Um, the federal government funds the administration and the states fund the actual benefits from employer taxes. So they have the option to choose how they wanna set employer tax rates, benefits, 
levels, the duration of benefits, and eligibility uh, requirements. So we're talking really pretty specifically about Minnesota today. They will talk about some things that are broader, but it, it is important to remember that things are, to the extent you have employees in other states, um, it's a pretty state-specific system. Um, and to that end, Minnesota Statutes Chapter 268 set up our system. Um, as many of you know, um, it's administered by the Department of Empl uh, Economic Development for the state of Minnesota. Um, eligibility is fairly straightforward. You're, you know, we base that earned off the least of 5.3% of the state's annual wage during the wage base period. Um, the other eligibility factor is that we have to be dealing with a loss of work through no fault of their own. But having said that, many of you will understand that unless there is gross misconduct involving um, an employee, most employees in a normal setting, aside from this setting where, that we're dealing with now, would still be getting uh, unemployment um, uh, compensation. Um, you have to be working less than 32 hours per week after you've applied, and the earnings must be less than the weekly benefit amount. Um, you know, generally speaking, for non-coronavirus um, uh, uh, unemployment, you would have to serve a one-week waiting period after your employment ended before receiving new uh, before receiving unemployment compensation. Right, and then another piece that's usually part of the requirement and is a little bit different right now is the um, requirement that everyone who received benefits be able, available, and actively seeking work. Um, that's because the, the system is set up theoretically with the idea that this will be temporary and you should be trying to find another job at the same time that you are accepting benefits. Now, the basic benefit calculation in Minnesota um, is designed to give people approximately half of what they would normally make. Um, and the way that, that that's done on an individual basis is you look at a person's income over about the last year um, the base period is, is about the last year. Um, there's some technicalities that don't really benefit us to get into here, but um, basically your average wage for the year, you'll get 50% of that uh, per week while you're on unemployment benefits, as long as 50% of your average wage isn't more than $740. Um, that's a state, uh, state law that we just won't pay more than that. Um, it could also be, for some people, 50% of the average um, wage during the quarter that they earned the most. Um, but most people who had continuous employment, it will be the, the first 50% um, of average wage during the base period um, because you can get more money under that calculation. And then we'll be talking, Alice, right, about how that's the the amount of money available may be changing uh, right. under the, the the Fair Credit or the Families First Corona Response Act. Right, actually, under the the CARES Act, there's so under many the new CARES acts. Act. <laughs> but um, right, and, so this is this and is and the extension time and the time period may be changing too in terms of the length of period, right? Right. So this is what Minnesota law provides for. Um, and we'll get into the specifics of how the CARES Act works, but one piece of that is that states have to enter into agreements with the federal government to make its provisions effective. So we don't have the, to all the details on how that's gonna work, but this is definitely true about Minnesota in particular. And so- Go ahead. Okay. Um, Governor Walls uh, instituted Executive Order 202005 at the beginning of, well, what feels like the beginning of this, just before we were all um, put on the stay-at-home order. Right. Uh, I believe it was 
March 16th. March 16th. Yeah. And um, so that suspends strict enforcement of the entire chapter 268, which is the part of Minnesota law that deals with unemployment insurance. So it gives some specific things that he has directed the agency to do. And then also has basically said, but I don't want you to enforce this strictly. So one of those pieces is that the non-payable week that Kurt mentioned earlier has been waived in Minnesota. This isn't true in every state yet. Um, it looks like it will be, but right now that's definitely true in Minnesota. And then I also mentioned earlier that people normally need to be available, able, available, and willing to work. But the statute says that you only need to accept suitable employment. So one of the things that Governor Walls did in his executive order is say, well, suitable employment is not going to include any employment that puts the health and safety of the applicant at risk or that puts the general public at risk. So that's a really big piece in terms of what people have to do to get benefits. This means um, that, that it will be significantly simpler for people to stay on benefits through through the duration of um, this crisis or however long things you know, stay quite as locked down as they are. Otherwise, that would be really difficult for a lot of people to get work or put people in a really difficult position of trying to decide how to prioritize their health versus their employment. So along those lines, it also notes that certain types of leaves of absence will not be considered voluntary. Um, voluntary leaves of absence are under the statute not, you can't be on a voluntary leave of absence per the statute and receive benefits. Um, Governor Walls clarified that deed is supposed to enforce the statute in a manner that considers leaves taken as a result of COVID-19 um, there are some specific pieces, for example, to take care of children or because you need to be isolated, um, someone in your family contracted the virus, anything like that. Those are not going to be voluntary leaves, so people will be eligible for benefits. Alice, do you want to move this slide forward? Yep. Oh. Yeah, and yeah. I think these are the things that uh, Alice was just talking about in terms of if there's a determination made by the health authorities that the presence of the applicant would jeopardize the health of others, um, uh, whether or not the applicant has actually contracted a communicable disease, that could be a basis for eligibility. A quarantine or isolation order would be a basis for uh, eligibility. And if there's a recommendation from health authorities uh, or by a healthcare professional that the applicant should isolate or self-quarantine due to elevated risk from COVID-19, um, that could be a basis for eligibility. Um, the last one here, I'm taking that first, uh, if the applicant um, uh, has children and the children school has been closed, um, for whatever, you know, due to the COVID-19, then that can be a basis for eligibility. And taking the first one last here, the applicant has been instructed by the employer not to come to the employer's place of business due to an outbreak of a communicable disease. Obviously, that can be a basis for eligibility as well. Um, we're in a slightly different uh, position with regard to the school closure thing, because for many students, school has started online um, as of this last Monday, but um, uh, the fact that the school itself is closed uh, can and still, I think, be a basis for eligibility. I mean, it's obviously something that could be disputed, but um, given the fact that the, the children are actually still at home, even if taking classes online at home, uh, puts you in a different position, uh, and I think that there's a there's a good argument that eligibility still exists. So uh, one of the things that we talked about here was the CARES Act, or I talked about right at the outset. 
Um, and the CARES Act is, again, it, you know, it's so important because it really provides things besides unemployment. Unemployment is the traditional answer with regard to these types of things. And for many businesses, it may be the appropriate answer. But I really think that um, uh, if you're a small or medium-sized business, you really need to be looking at the Small Business Administration's guide uh, with regard to the CARES Act. And it's simply named, and it's on their website, the Small Business Owner's Guide to the CARES Act. And it lays out all of the different types of financial relief, which are significant in terms of the Paycheck Protection Program, um, the economic injury loan, um, and other types of loans. Uh, they all come with strings attached with regard to um, things. I mean, for example, on the Payroll Protection Act, um, we were discussing before we got on, um, on the webinar that in fact, obviously you cannot lay somebody off and then seek protection for that particular person or his or her salary or, or wage if she's been laid off, can't seek that protection under the Payroll Protection Act. But um, these are all things that um, are kind of outside of the box, so to speak, in terms of unemployment compensation, but um, they're very helpful. And the other thing that's very helpful, it seems to me, is that the Small Business Administration is providing um, counseling with regard to uh, using this program. So, you know, in addition to your financial uh, advisors and you know, your businesses, accountants, and people like that who also can provide insight with regard to this, you may be able to map out a strategic plan with regard to using the Payroll Protection Act and the other provisions here, in addition to potentially using unemployment compensation at some later point down the line. Again, with this situation evolving, it's, it's really important to understand that the most recent iteration, I guess, is that um, the COVID-19 virus may be coming back to us uh, in the fall of 2020, uh, something similar to a, a flu in terms of how the flu will recur beginning in the fall and continuing into the winter. So that's one of the things that you may want to uh, talk over with your uh, business advisors as to how you want to use both of these acts to your advantages. Um, you know, some of the other provisions that are in the CARE Act that are helpful are the individual tax rebates. Um, obviously that can be very helpful for the, uh, for injecting money into, into the system. Um, I've already spoken about uh, some of the payroll tax credits that would be available and forgivable loans. Uh, through the Small Business Administration. So these are all things that it really behooves you as a business owner to make sure that you're aware of and that you're thinking about as you map out what the next, um, the next uh, move is. Hey, Kurt, I do have a question that's pretty relevant to this. This is Dave yeah. Meyer. Um, Steve Ty um, asked, if a business lays off an employee now, and assuming the business qualifies for an SBA loan for continuing the business to meet payroll, and lays off no further employees, will the business qualify for the forgiveness provision for the loan under the recently passed legislation? You know, you'd have to look at that situation in specific with regard to that, but I think the answer is potentially yes. I mean, I, I can't give you a legal opinion to that effect, but uh, the answer has to be potentially yes, it seems to me, so long as, and this is really important, that the representations made to the Small Business Administration make it very clear as to who the employees are at the time that you're uh, applying for the loan so that they know and that the representation is clear that this employee who has since been laid off um, uh, is not part of the, uh, was not part of the organization at the time that you made the application. One of the ways that you run into trouble, obviously, is you make an application saying you have, let's say, 100 employees, when in fact you only have 90 employees because you've laid off 10. 
I mean, that's one of the ways that you, you can get into serious trouble with the Small Business Administration or any government agency with regard to uh, that kind of a situation. Now, in terms of the specifics, whether or not you lay somebody off and that disqualifies you entirely from the program, I don't know the answer to that. But I do know that the Small Business Administration will have the answer to that, including through their counseling program. But my suspicion is that laying off one employee while retaining all of the other employees and using the Small Business Administration to finance payroll for all of the other employees probably is acceptable. But again, that, that's um, my uh, generalized opinion from 30,000 feet up. Sure, thank you. So, so, so uh, go ahead, Alice. I was just gonna say, so Kurt, Kurt went through um, a number of the other pieces of the CARES Act and um, we just wanted to give a little bit more detail on what's going on with unemployment, given that that's sort of what we were focused on today. Um, there are four types of expansion opportunities for states to take advantage of in the CARES Act, and everything is set up with respect to unemployment as requiring an agreement between the state and federal government. So, I mean, we, we expect that states would take advantage of this. Um, it's essentially free money for their constituents, but that, that hasn't been determined. Um, so the four pieces are one, there is a provision that the federal government will pay the, the benefits a person is entitled to for the waiting period, which is usually a week, um, if the state agrees to waive that. Um, Minnesota has already waived that, so that won't impact um, individuals, but that, that is how that will be funded, assuming that the state enters into um, an agreement to that effect. Alice, question for you, and that is if, we, um, if, we're letting, if we've let somebody go before March 1 of 2020, which really isn't that long ago, it's basically a month ago, but that the waiver doesn't apply for people let go before March one. Is that right? Uh, I don't. Well, I'm not a hundred percent sure how that will be administered. If people were let go before March one and haven't applied for benefits yet, yeah. um, then then they wouldn't have a waiting week if they've already served the waiting week. Um, I'm not sure whether that's something that so, would be. So the answer later. is, so the answer is that even if you, um, because the, the, the order says March 1, but as a practical matter, you've already waited more than a week if it's before March 1. So you shouldn't have any issues then, right? Right. Okay. Um, so the, one of the major pieces that would be relevant for you know, your employees, if you are feeling the need to lay people off or reduce their hours. Um, we talked about the sorts of benefits that they can get through Minnesota. Um, and if Minnesota enters into an agreement with the federal government um, under CARES Act, they can supplement everyone's benefits with $600 of, <clears throat> excuse me, of federal money. So the federal government has said, if you agree that you will, you know, administer this and not reduce people's benefits, um, we will supplement everyone's benefits with $600 a week. So the $600 a week thing probably seems really arbitrary, uh, but it was actually selected because the original intent was to try and find a way to give people full income replacement. Um, as we talked about earlier, Minnesota and most states have structured their unemployment programs as um, a replacement of about 50% of a person's income. And the federal government wanted to put in place something that would bridge the gap um, left for people who are unemployed because of COVID. And administratively, they decided it would be too difficult 
to try and have every state give people 100% of their own income because of all the differences in, in technology and various things I'm not privy to the details of, but essentially they said, all right, we're just gonna look at what, what does an average person make? What does an average person get in benefits? And we're gonna say, okay, that, that looks like average person makes $1,000, gets 400. We're just gonna give everyone 600. Um, and call that, you know, the best sort of the, the best approximation we can make. Um, so there is a situation in which people could theoretically get more money under um, this emergency increase than than they would if they were working full time. So that's one piece. There's another section that is um, pandemic emergency unemployment compensation, which is another type of agreement that the state can enter into to extend the eligibility period for people who've already exhausted state benefits. Um, it, they get the same amount of income and they can have another 13 weeks of benefits under that program. Finally, the one that you've probably heard the most about is the pandemic unemployment assistance. And that program is in some ways the most significant because it's what extends to cover people who are not covered by state programs. Um, for you as business owners, it's probably more likely that your employees would be covered by state benefits um, originally, but the pandemic unemployment assistance is what would cover self-employed people, people who do sort of gig economy jobs and that sort of thing. As long as they self-certify that they're out of work for one of, I think there's maybe eight or nine reasons that are related to COVID. Um, one of which is that their employer has closed um, operations because of COVID. If they self-certify that, yeah, that's why I'm not working, then they're eligible to get what they would get under the state benefits program if their income you know, is something that the state would consider plus $600. So it's kind of trying to put everyone on the same footing. And that program is available currently for 39 weeks. Um, and that one can actually backdate. So or Kurt was talking about somebody who, who'd been employed, unemployed for a while if they didn't um, seek benefits, they can, assuming the state enters into an agreement on this, seek benefits for time that has already passed under the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. Okay. So how will my employee apply for unemployment benefits? Um, it really hasn't changed. Um, for those of you very familiar, you know that um, uh, the Department of Economic Development for the state of Minnesota uh, is the department that is still made, is still engaged in um, processing and paying out on these claims. That includes, uh, we think it's going to include, right Alice, we think it's going to include the $600 payment, which we think is going to come from the state, through the from the federal government, but through the state. We're not sure on that though, right. correct at this point. Yeah, we're, st we're still waiting for Department of Labor, United States Department of Labor um, guidance with regard to that. But I guess the key from the standpoint of um, the employee, uh, obviously, is that the money is coming one way or another. Right. And the, the act specifically contemplates having states use their agencies. Um, I don't see a reason that it, Minnesota deed would not be. They use some language about the capability associated with the agency. I, I don't see a reason why it wouldn't be deed in Minnesota, but yeah, it hasn't been fully determined. So will the payment of unemployment benefits under CARES impact my business's tax rate? And the answer in Minnesota is no. Uh, under Governor Walz's executive order 20-05, 
uh, unemployment benefits due to the COVID-19 outbreak will not impact an employer's tax rate. So additional benefits under CARES are federally funded rather than paid from the state trust fund. So um, the $600 that we're talking about is coming directly from the federal government. It's not coming from the state coffers. Next question is under CARES, can my employees quit or choose to take a leave and be better paid than they would be if they were working? And the answer with regard to that is um, maybe. Employees cannot quit or voluntarily take an unpaid leave of absence and receives, receive benefits unless they have quote unquote good cause to do so. What would be good cause in your uh, opinion, Alice? Well, so this is sort of one of the areas where things are still really in flux. Um, lots of states, the federal government, before they passed the CARES Act, the Department of Labor said, hey, states, you know, under the law, under the unemployment insurance law that you, your programs are authorized by, you have the flexibility to give people benefits and we want you to expand those. So before CARES, lots of states already had in the works um, ways that they were gonna try to expand access. Um, you know, Minnesota, we've talked about Governor Walz's order, um, and that was sort of, that's sort of the way Minnesota has done it now, but other states are doing different things. And one of the things some states are doing is redefining good cause. So, it's not you know, clear what that will mean going forward. Um, right now, good cause you know, needs to be uh, a, something like a constructive discharge, really um, mm -hmm. unbearable type conditions. But I doubt that that will be viewed that way um, when you know, actual benefits decisions are made about people who say, I, I didn't feel I could go to work because um, my employer wasn't social distancing and I was afraid of COVID. I mean, that's not right. certain, but I, that, I would expect that that would be um, practically a good cause. Right, and, and just so we all understand, um, Alice used a kind of a legal jargon phrase called constructive discharge. And constructive discharge is essentially the principle in the law that the employee, the employer, without telling you that it's uh, it wants you out of the out of the workplace, essentially forces you out by having to endure things that uh, for most employees would be unacceptable, such as, for example, as Alice talked about. Um, not taking care with regard to communicable diseases in the workplace. That would be uh, a classic situation of a constructive discharge. Next question is, can employees use vacation or other paid time off while receiving unemployment benefits? And generally the answer to that is no. States are entitled to regulate this differently, but in Minnesota, an employee is not eligible for benefits while receiving such type of pay. Um, so that's, that obviously can be uh, uh, an interesting situation when an employee is leaving employment and the employee is being paid uh, the remaining, let's say paid time off uh, that he or she has accrued before leaving employment. That can make a difference as to when the person is actually eligible uh, for unemployment given the fact that you're burning through on uh, accrued paid time off. Right, and one of the things to keep in mind is that, you know, this answer seems very simple, but we get questions, you know, well, what if I, they have two vacation days and they use two days in a week? Um, and under Minnesota law, at least, the benefits will be prorated. So somebody in that situation would still want to apply for benefits and deed asks all the questions that they need to know about how to calculate benefits. And one of those 
things that would come out as, yeah, I got vacation for two days um, and they should be eligible for benefits, you know, three, what I guess it would be three fifths of their entitlement um, there. So one of the biggest things to remember here, and it's, I know it's hard to have a situation where there's so much that's maybe and your employees are asking you or, or you don't want to take action um, when you're not sure what's going to happen with regard to, to their income. But we would just encourage you to tell anyone who thinks they might be eligible to apply for benefits. This stuff is changing pretty rapidly as people try to find ways or as governments try to find ways to help people handle this situation. And um, deed on a lot of sticky questions, their response is tell them to apply. And right. I think there's a possibility that if things, you know, some issue that hasn't been addressed comes up enough in applications, then, then it will be and your people will be, will be in the right position to take advantage of that. And, and I would add to that that even with this rapidly evolving situation, um, the Department of Economic Development um, deed has in fact put up a frequently answered question guide that includes answering some but not all of the questions regarding COVID-19 related unemployment. So in, as, you know, in that frequently answered question guide, they also talk about the fact that they're waiting for guidance from DOL. So as an employer, uh, it really behooves you to spend a few minutes occasionally going to the Department of Unemployment, especially if you're gonna have some folks who are gonna be unemployed, I should say that. Um, spending some time with that site to see what the latest developments are from DEED's perspective, because they are updating that fairly frequently. And like I said, what they have there now already acknowledges that they're gonna have more developments, more answers to those frequently answered questions very shortly. So we need to be paying attention to that as employers um, and business owners to, to see what's being developed. And they are uh, updating it a lot because I check it every day. <laughs> I, I was gonna say, I, I just checked it this morning and as a reminder to everyone that's watching, if you get an email from SBA or from Deed, make sure that you do open it because we submitted as a business, BusyWeb did, and I thought we were set. And then we got another email saying you have to re you have to resubmit this short form to be eligible for the new thing that just came out yesterday about the ten thousand dollar emergency relief that goes directly through your bank. So there's all kinds of stuff going, and it's all changing. So if you see something from SBA or Deed, make sure that you open it. Um. Are we at the spot where we should do the questions or do we have a couple more sure. things we want to cover? Oh, perfect. Um, so from Stephen, if a business lays off an employee now and assuming the business qualifies for SBA loan for continuing business to meet payroll and lays off no further employees, will the business qualify for the forgiveness provision of the loan? Uh, I, I asked that already, I'm sorry. I was going from top to bottom. Um, do businesses need to be careful to use specific language when laying off an employee to ensure they are able to seek unemployment insurance benefits. Some businesses have heard that if some voluntarily offers to furlough for the sake of saving another job at their company, they may, they may be eligible. Is that true? That's a really interesting question because um, one of the frequently asked questions on the, um, one of the frequently asked questions on the deed site was, what if an employee voluntarily ends his employment his or her employment in this, you know, in at these times, during these times. And generally speaking, if you resign from employment, you're not going to be eligible for unemployment compensation. But the answer from Deed was you should apply and we'll we'll sort it out. Mm -hmm. And the reason being that there, there are people who are still upset, very upset about the idea of having a discharge on their record, even if it's a layoff, as opposed to a discharge for some some specific reason other than you know a, a downturn in the business um, so deeds advice and if you're an employer or an employee the uh, the advice to an employee would be you should apply regardless you have the ability to um, 
you have the ability to have it considered one way or another. Um, from the employer standpoint, if we're interested and if we're interested in making sure that the employee is uh, eligible for unemployment compensation, then it makes it it behooves us to say something generally speaking in writing saying that you know because of the current economic circumstances uh, we're terminating your employment um, you know something something to that effect with regard to that that makes it quite clear then to deed as well as to the employee that the person is going to be eligible um, yeah. if the, i can just only, add to that kurt yes um, there's actually a provision in Minnesota law that is not in a lot of states, but I'm assuming this is a Minnesota question. There is a provision in Minnesota law that says an individual can, can get benefits if they voluntarily resign if that avoids the layoff of another person. But that can't be a speculative, well, I assume my employer is going to lay off and so I'll just take this bullet I think is coming, it has to be actually the case and the employer has to verify that. So like Kurt said, it, it is something, if this is something you think is happening, you wanna make sure that that's in writing um, and that that's a decision that you, you know, they, they said that they wanted to do that according to a program. So this, it's a little bit complicated and you'd want to get um, specific legal advice, but it has to be something that you're allowing employees to do. You have to accept the specific person's offer to do it and you need to document it with deed. So it, it's a little bit more complicated than just, um, you know, a normal, somebody says they were laid off and that's not voluntary. Okay. Um, another question, and this, this has been something that I've heard a lot about, so hopefully this will be a good one. Um, what should a company know about furloughing employees versus cutting pay or hours as it relates both to the employee being able to receive user or unemployment benefits or the company being able to seek SBA loans? Well, uh, with regard to the issue of furlough, you know, it's, it's really going to depend uh, whether or not we're furloughing an employee for uh, a definite or indefinite period of time with regard to other issues such as Warren Act issues. And again, if you're over 50 employees, then potentially you have Warren Act issues. If you're under 50 employees, then you don't potentially have Warren Act issues. Um, if you're unemployed for, let's say we're furloughing you for a period of three months, saying we're now going to put you uh, you know, we're going to furlough you with the idea that we're going to hire you back on June 1st or July 1st, you are going to be eligible for unemployment compensation benefits for the period that you're out of work. What would, Alice, would you agree with that? Yeah, so in Minnesota, I don't think that there is a difference on, on a totally unemployment level. Um, obviously, Kurt mentioned the WARN Act, and that is a consideration that you know, if you're making those decisions, you need to think about as well. But from a benefits perspective, it really is most, the, the thing that really matters is how many hours, if any, a person is working. So right. um, it doesn't necessarily matter how you categorized it in, in terms of a furlough or temporary layoff. It, it will matter to deed what that imper that person is earning and how many hours they're working. And the other thing that's really important in this situation is, um, you know, there's a there's an issue as to whether uh, a furlough amounts to not in the unemployment compensation realm, but other realms as to whether or not it amounts to uh, a layoff that is equivalent to a Warren Act layoff. And when I say WARN Act, I should explain that. WARN Act is an acronym for the Wor Worker Adjustment Retraining um, Act, um, uh, which is the notice that we're supposed to be giving to workers uh, when there's going to be a layoff. And a layoff 
is either a, ma a mass closure or plant closure, and again, has to be 50 employees or more, or 33% uh, a mass layoff, I should say, uh, would be 33% of our workforce would be laid off. And again, you have to have at least 50 employees in the workplace. And what we're supposed to be doing in that situation is we are supposed to be giving notice to the workers 60 days ahead of time that in fact they're going to be uh, laid off. Now, when we run into an issue like uh, an unforeseen circumstance, uh, such as the coronavirus, unforeseen circumstances like the coronavirus, like um, for example, the Iraq war or the uh, terrorist attack on 9-11, those are all things that may justify us saying we don't have to give advance notice, we're giving you notice now. And that's a really big deal because if we're gonna give advance notice, that means basically people are gonna get 60 days of pay before the, the layoff takes effect. And what we're saying is that these unforeseen circumstances justify us laying you off immediately without the advance notice, which means without giving you 60 days of pay. I can tell you from a past life where I was um, working for an airline, uh, I issued notices um, uh, to um, employees as well as employees unions and as, as to government agencies saying that acts involving the Iraq war justified um, an abbreviated less than 60 day notice with regard to laying people off. Um, with regard to, again, the issue of furloughs versus a Warren Act notice, that's really almost a separate, a separate seminar as to whether those people furloughed can constitute um, or amount to a layoff or a plant closure. And it gets even more complicated than that because with Warren, you look back approximately, I believe 90 days to see how many people have been laid off in the last 90 days so that you can, you can inadvertently and without knowledge reach the Warren Act notice limit uh, with a layoff that occurs over 90 days. And if you haven't complied with Warren, that can be, that can be a problem. Slightly different direction now. Um, from Stephen, are there discrimination issues that need to be considered when laying off an employee with extended illness, but no diagnosed finding of COVID-19? Well, what I would say with regard to that is if we're gonna lay off employees um, and one of the employees happens to be ill, I would wanna make sure that we're dealing with that employee in an even-handed manner with the non-ill employees. You know, part of the bread and butter that Alice and I do are discrimination defense cases, mm -hmm. uh, which means that somebody's making the claim that they're being treated differently. And the reason that they're being treated differently and, you know, usually more harshly is because of uh, their sex, their race, or in some situations, their alleged disability. So to answer your question, we want to make sure that the person um, who uh, is allegedly ill is being treated in an even-handed manner with people who are not ill. So um, if in fact we're laying off, you know, if we're laying off everyone in a particular section, but we're also reaching over to this other section of the employee of the business and laying off this um, employee um, out of a section that no one else is being laid off in because we think, well, now's the time that we can get rid of this problem or troublemaker. That raises questions as to whether or not, it's not really the layoff, but, um, the layoff is providing an opportunity for quote unquote cover to engage in discrimination by getting rid of this uh, other troubled employee. So again, it's the whole idea of even handed treatment that doesn't recognize the person's disability or lack 
of disability, doesn't recognize the person's illness or the other people's lack of illness. Alice? Yeah, um, I agree with Kurt. And I would say, you know, the, it's, it's really hard. It's not something we can necessarily answer beyond that because there's so many individualized considerations involved. And if you're talking about terminating or, or laying off this individual um, or something related to like, because they're not coming to work because they're sick or, you know, we would need a lot more details. And I think that's something that, you know, it might make sense to consult a lawyer about um, because you do want to be careful to avoid, um, you know, to avoid facts that will really lend themselves to a discrimination claim that can can be a really costly thing to deal with and, and not something that you need right now. Forever, and, then, but, you know. <laughs> and then just one more, whoop, one more point, and that is that, and bringing it back to unemployment compensation, we should not be telling people not to apply for unemployment. We shouldn't be, obviously, we shouldn't be threatening them if they apply for unemployment. Uh, the statute, Chapter 268 of the Minnesota Statutes, provides a cause of action to employees if we inhibit or retaliate against them for trying to file for unemployment compensation. So uh, again, with regard to unemployment compensation in particular, if we do something to inhibit or prevent them from going forward and making a claim, that in and of itself could be a claim made against us as the business. Good point. Great, that's actually all the questions I have right now. If any other attendees would like to ask a question, please do so. We're gonna be here for the next couple of minutes. Um, if we don't have any questions within about 30 seconds or so. So uh, if, if you do have a question in the chat, just go ahead and post it, or if it's gonna take a while to type, say I'm typing so that we know to hang on for you. Um, but otherwise, I'll turn it over to Kurt Ellis and JP to offer closing remarks before the top of the hour. Um, this is Kurt. Um, it's, it's really, you know, it's a very rapidly evolving situation with regard to unemployment um, and with regard to uh, both loans, forgivable loans, tax credits. Uh, one of the things that we didn't talk about was the Family First Corona Response Act. That act in terms of providing for paid sick leave um, uh, provides another basis uh, for um, opportunity for leave that can in fact be used, uh, that, can be, uh, that can be susceptible to using, use of tax credits. So these are all things that are, are out there and that uh, are in the process of being evolved. They're emergency Department of Labor regulations or interim regulations coming out. The one thing I would say regarding the Family First, um, the Family First uh, Corona Response Act is that our firm has put together a policy with regard to that and, and application forms. So for many of us um, on this line who are uh, in, uh, working uh, and have um, employees who are less than 50 total or less than 50 total in various different locations, we may not have an FMLA policy, but now under the Emergency Act, under the FICRA Act, the Family First Corona Response Act, uh, we're supposed to be um, considering these employees uh, for potential leave purposes. So the firm has put together um, uh, a package of materials to allow employers to quickly uh, respond and be able to um, consider and process these claims. So if that's something that you and your business are interested in, uh, I'd encourage you to use my email address uh, and telephone number uh, to give me a call and we're glad to uh, we're glad to talk to you about that um, uh, that policy and that package and see if we can make arrangements uh, to get that out to you. 
Thank you. Before Alice jumps in, I just wanted to break in. Stephen had one last question. Will Twin West consider a webinar on the CARE Act SBA loans for small businesses? JP, I know you did a video chat yesterday um, on some details of that. Um, is there programming in place or that we're thinking about for that? Yeah, we'll continue to do more. Um, and especially as it's unclear now when the most recent iteration of the stimulus will be open for application for businesses. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, we've put out a series of videos. We have the third one went up yesterday, highlighting what loan programs were already in existence, uh, what was in the most recently passed federal stimulus, and then yesterday covered the meat of that, which is the Paycheck uh, Protection Program. So we will continue to push out information on that. And I think, uh, of course, um, as we learn more and those resources become available to apply for, um, we will continue to push out different and expanding content on that for sure. Awesome. And Shannon did send a note. Just a big thank you to Kurt and Alice from Shannon Fold, the Twin West Chamber President. Um, these are very complex issues and we appreciate your time. Uh, she did have one advice would you give to business leaders as they try to sort out their individual situations and alice i know you also wanted to have a, a quick sign off so um what do you think well kurt do you have a particular advice i don't want to <laughs> run you over yeah, my, my my particular advice is we need to be paying attention um to the websites for the united states department of labor um the Department of Labor and Industry for the state of Minnesota indeed with regard to these issues so that we're keeping up to speed. The other thing, um, you know, and uh, I would pitch this, the coronavirus website at littler.com, the coronavirus website at littler.com, you can go there and that's a resource, doesn't cost anything to look at that and that will have periodic updates too because this is this stuff is moving at a rate that is just um, beyond belief in terms of speed. Um, it's just moving so fast that you just have to keep up with it and understand that uh, things are evolving um, as we speak. Yeah. Go ahead, Alice. Yeah, I would just say on that point, you know, it's I know it's really frustrating to be in such an uncertain time and to have these huge changes come down and then, you know, you feel like, well, th why aren't there, you know, why didn't they think of this? Um, and, you know, things are being done a little bit out of normal order, um, just because of the emergency situation. So, you know, some of these detailed questions are, people are talking to um, the Department of Labor, people from Littler are close, talking closely with people in the Department of Labor. I'm sure many, many other people are bringing these issues to their attention um, and they are working to get guidance out. So as time goes on, we should get more information about, you know, specific issues that are arising. So I agree with Kurt, you know, we keep, try to keep up on, um, on what's coming out and, you know, raise issues as you have them. Um, hopefully things will um, more, Clarity will will come with time, and um, at least with respect to the sick leave and and families, the FFCRA. I know that you know the federal government is looking to help people comply at least in the first 30 or so days versus um, you know taking enforcement action. So these are all things that that we need to do and to try to comply with as best we can, but to the extent that there, you know, aren't clear answers, you just need to do your best. And um, there's there's some acknowledgement of that, I think, from the government as well. Excellent. Well, Kurt, Alice, JP, thank you so much for the time today and for sharing your knowledge. I will note for everyone that if you missed part of this event or if you wanted to share it with anyone, please feel free to do so. You can go to the Twin West Chamber of Commerce um, YouTube channel to download this and actually check out the Twin West Chamber of Commerce's coronavirus resource page as well. You can just go to twinwest.com. There's a big, huge link right at the top of the page. Click on that to go there and there will be this recording linked as well. Thank you all very much for your time and attention today. Um, we're all in this together and thank you for your help today because we all need it.
So um, have you. a wonderful afternoon and day. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you all. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye now.